This uh, is a continuing uh, lecture on uh, critical methodologies, and uh, in this lecture we'll deal with rhetorical criticism and literary approaches. And this is in conjunction with the rise of synchronic analysis in the 1970s through the 1990s. Rhetorical criticism, or the literary approach, refers to an essentially synchronic, same-time type of criticism of the final form of text. Now, there's synchronic uh, uh, criticism and then there's diachronic criticism. Uh, form and uh, source criticism are both diachronic uh, approaches. They're looking at things through time whereas the literary approach is uh, looking at things at the same time, synchronically, at the same time as the final form of the text. Rhetorical criticism, or the literary approach, asks uh, why, regardless of the sources, an author or editor would have chosen to express himself in quite the way that he did. Now, new critic uh, rhetorical criticism is actually a development of a movement known as new criticism, although from our perspective that would be rather old new criticism. But uh, nonetheless, new criticism was a movement in English literature in the early to mid-20th century. Uh, it emphasized the final form of a text rather than its historical development or production. And so people that studied uh, English literature on the basis of new criticism, uh, they would say that, well, the biographical or psychological or historical background of an author may be largely irrelevant to the task of, criti of criticism, uh, preferring rather to depend upon a close reading of the text itself. Uh, they would use the analogy of, uh, you know, looking at a chair produced by a carpenter. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know the biography of the carpenter to admire his workmanship, his chair. And so uh, in literature, you don't necessarily need the biography of an author to admire the work which he has created. So this... Uh, is a uh, synchronic approach that downplays historical uh, backdrops. You might say it's a reaction against 19th century historical criticism, uh, which is similar in biblical studies to the historical critical approach. They were reacting against that and going back to the final form of the text to emphasize what could be had from that. Now, a little bit of the relationship with diachronic approaches. Liter the literary approach does not necessarily have to reject all diacritical answers. So you could say that, well, yes, it does have a literary history. We can uh, trace some of that history, but uh, nonetheless, uh, what we're interested is in is the meaning of the final form of the text. So in theory, you can have both synchronic and diachronic explanations, though in practice, uh, the literary approach proponents uh, usually think uh, that diachronic explanations have been overly emphasized and that they are overly speculative, and they're not entirely wrong in that regard. Moreover, synchronic answers can be alternative to diachronic uh, answers to things. Uh, so, for example, you have in Genesis 15, you have kind of a, looks like two accounts of uh, how uh, the covenant was uh, being made with Abraham. And that could be two sources though it could give, be given a purely synchronic explanation and say that, well, what's going on here is a, uh, a literary technique known as synoptic uh, expansive storytelling, where you tell a story once, 
and then you go back and tell it again from a different perspective. Well, uh, that's a rather different explanation than to say that, well, uh, the first part of Genesis 15 is one source and the second part is an entirely different source. Um, and so they can be alternatives to each other. Now, synchronic literary approaches have most commonly been applied to narratives, uh, though they can be applied to any genre. Uh, when I did my dissertation way back in 1994, uh, my uh, dissertation uh, applied the synchronic literary approach to uh, the laws of the Book of the Covenant, which is in uh, uh, Exodus uh, uh, 2022 through 2333. That's the Book of the Covenant. And I attempted to uh, argue that synchronic explanations of uh, uh, the phenomena in the text uh, of that passage uh, make as much, if not more, sense than the diachronic explanations that uh, most scholars had been giving up until that point. And uh, that's uh, the dissertation that earned me a PhD. Well, let's look at uh, how a literary approach would work, especially as applied to narratives. A literary approach uh, is going to ask certain questions of the text, uh, and it'll involve such things as trying to discern points of view, looking at characterization, uh, looking at plot development, uh, looking at dialogue and how people uh, are developed by the way that they talk, and also a free direct discourse where an author may be summarizing what they say rather than giving uh, everything they might have said. Uh, it'll look for artful use of language. It'll look for repetition and this same kind of synoptic, resumptive, expansive storytelling that I've just mentioned. And it'll also involve gap filling. So let's uh, look into some of these things that uh, are aspects of a literary approach analysis of a narrative text. First of all, point of view. Point of view is the position or perspective from which a story is told. Now, that could be the perspective from which the uh, narrator tells a story. The narrator could be a first-person narrator where he tells his own story, or he could be a third-person narrator uh, who uh, tells a story about other people. Um, but a variation on this is that uh, point of view can also be uh, putting yourself in the shoes of a particular character and asking yourself the question, well, why is he saying what he's saying? Why is he doing what he's doing? What, what's his point of view on what's going on in the story uh, around him? Uh, both of those are point of view kinds of uh, issues. Uh, now, in the Bible, the narrator's point of view is always considered a omniscient narrator. Uh, by an omniscient narrator, narrator, we mean the narrator always knows the truth. He knows what's going on. He knows even what's in the mind of his characters. And he uh, uh, can tell us uh, those sorts of things. Uh, he's also a prophetic narrator. He, he knows what God is thinking as well. Uh, because that's been revealed to him as a prophet. And so uh, the Bible's narrator is an omniscient narrator. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah does use some first-person narration, so does the book of Daniel. And so you do get those types of uh, narr narrative points of view. Uh, God's point of view is also something that uh, particularly we as uh, Christians want to ask. Uh, God, as a character in various narratives, can give his own point of view. Uh, but as it turns out, since the narrators of the Bible are uh, essentially all prophets, uh, their point of view is the same as God's point of view. So uh, whatever the narrator says the truth of the matter is, well, that's really what God is saying as well, again, because our narrator is an omniscient narrator, and our narrator uh, is a uh, giving a prophetic view of the narratives, uh, and so therefore he can speak for God. 
Now, another thing with point of view, you can say, well, what's the point of view of the character in the story? And uh, you could look at, for example, the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and is sending out Uriah to uh, be killed in, in battle to cover up uh, his sin. Well, what was David's point of view when he called Uriah back from the battle uh, after David got uh, Uriah's uh, wife pregnant? And, uh, well, he comes back and says he's a good soldier and that because, well, first of all, he doesn't go back to his own house. He sleeps with uh, David's servants. Uh, and then uh, um, when David finds out about this, he asks, you know, why didn't you go back to your home? And he says, well, I'm such a good soldier and the war is going on. The ark is, uh, uh, you know, in, in battle. How can I enjoy the benefits of hearth and home when uh, all these things are going on? Um uh, well, what did David think about that little speech? Um, and of course, uh, part of the problem is that he was at home enjoying the uh, benefits of hearth and home. And indeed, uh, Uriah said he couldn't go back and sleep with his wife uh, under these circumstances. Well, of course, David had been sleeping with his wife uh, while he was away. Uh, and so he, he might have been a little insulted by the way that Uriah put it. Uh, the other question is, well, what was Uriah's re point of view when he refused to go? Well, what he says is that, well, I'm a really good soldier, and therefore I, I couldn't go home and enjoy the benefits of hearth and home and sleep with my wife under these circumstances. Uh, but from the time that he first met with David and he was sent out with a gift, it looked like he was going to go home, but then he ended up sleeping with the servants of David, well, you might ask, well, who was it that brought Bathsheba to the palace where David committed adultery with her? Well, you might say it would have been the servants of David. And you might further ask, would rumor of such things uh, be circulating among the servants of David? And then you might further speculate, well, when he met with some of the servants of David and ended up uh, spending the night with them, did they tell him about what they heard in the rumor mill in the palace? And uh, maybe Uriah knows. In which case, his answer, oh, how can I, as a good soldier, enjoy the benefits of hearth and home and sleep with my wife while the battle's going on? Maybe that was Uriah's, Uriah, Uriah's way of uh, uh, trying to uh, insult the king without letting on that he actually knows what's going on. Well, that's that's point of view uh, when you ask those questions. Uh, the answers I just gave were a little bit speculative, uh, but nonetheless, uh, um, you should put yourself in each character's point of view and ask why is he doing what he's doing. Why did he call Uriah back from the battle? Well, clearly he wanted him to go home to sleep with his wife to cover up his adultery uh, since Bathsheba was already pregnant. Characterization is another thing that the literary approach uh, involves itself in. Uh, painting a verbal picture of what character, uh, what the characters in the story are, are like. Uh, now in narratives, there are, broadly speaking, two types of characters, round characters and flat characters. Uh, round characters are people that, well, you don't know really anything about them. Uh, maybe you know their name, or maybe you know their title or their job. So there was a servant there. We don't know the name of him. We don't know how old he was or hardly anything about him. There was just a servant there. And so if we know nothing about a person other than maybe at most their name, we'd call them a flat character. And actually in the story we were just alluding to, Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11, well, she in that story is a flat character. Uh, we, don't, we know her name, but we don't know whether, you know, what she was thinking when David called her to the palace. We don't know what she was thinking when David propositioned her to sleep with her. Did, did she go willingly or unwillingly? 
unwillingly in the sense of um, who can say no to a, a king who could put put you to death if he doesn't like what you're doing. <clears throat> we, we don't know any of that. And therefore, in this story, she is a flat character. On the other hand, there's a round character. A round character is fully developed. We know something of their personalities and what they're like. And in another story, in 1 Kings chapter 1, Bathsheba there is not a flat character, but a round character. That's the story where she, uh, along with Nathan the prophet, uh, plot together to try to fight for Solomon's kingship and save his life and their lives uh, when uh, the brother of Solomon was trying to usurp the throne while David was on his deathbed. Well, there uh, Bathsheba shows up as a much more round character. A way that you can uh, develop characterization is uh, several fold. Uh, there's description. Uh, Saul was tall. David was ruddy in appearance. Uh, Bathsheba is beautiful. Those little descriptions of people uh, allow you to get a little bit of an idea of what they were like. You can also uh, develop characters by statements of a character's inner life. Uh, Amnon loved his sister Tamar, but after he raped her, he hated her. Uh, Amnon was one of the sons of David. Tamar was uh, one of the daughters of uh, 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 of David, um, but uh, different wives uh, between the two, so they were half brother and half sister. Um, but anyway, uh, that says a whole lot about Amnon, his uh, feelings of love and feelings of hatred uh, after he raped her. Uh, also, uh, Jacob loved his youngest son, Joseph, more than the other brothers. Well, that says something about J Jacob, that he, he played favorites in the family, which is generally not a good thing to do in a family. You can also use speech and action to uh, develop characters. So Moses said, who am I that I should go and speak to Pharaoh? Uh, well, that says something about Moses' humility. Or there's silence when Abraham is told to take Isaac, his only son, to Moriah and uh, go up to a mountain and offer him up as a, a burnt offering there. And he doesn't say a word, but he just uh, you know loads up the donkey, goes to the place, goes uh, with his son to, uh, uh, to do uh, the thing that he was commanded to do. And... Uh, his silence in doing so shows his faith and his uh, fear of God that, well, he may not understand and we don't know what he's thinking, uh, but he certainly is willing to obey whatever it is uh, that God uh, commands him to do, and that's what he does. Uh, sometimes uh, speech and action uh, can be shown by the speech of other characters. And so God as a character characterizes Job as a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And so uh, the speech of others can characterize uh, a different character. Characterization can also be uh, made by making contrast between characters. Uh, Jacob and Esau had rather different attitudes towards their birthright. Uh, Esau was willing to sell it for just a, uh, uh, a bowl of uh, porridge, uh, whereas uh, Jacob considered it uh, valuable and uh, uh, went to extreme means and unethical means, actually, to uh, try to obtain it. Well, very different people. Uh, Esau... Uh, was also different in that he loved to be a hunter, whereas Jacob was more of a homebody. Reuben, unlike uh, the other brothers, tried to save Joseph when they took him and threw him in a cave. He, he didn't like the idea of uh, doing him in. Now, yet another uh, technique of uh, narratives is to trace the development of plot. 
And plot tends to go in the following pattern. I mean, this is just kind of a typical pattern. You have an opening where you learn something about the setting and what's going on, but then there's some sort of problem or some sort of conflict, and that pre creates uh, certain complications and tensions. And eventually that complication and tension reaches a climax. And, uh, and then uh, the story begins to resolve. Uh, and so the tension uh, lessens, and then you have a closing at the end of the story. Uh, that's a, a typical pattern in storytelling, and that's not just true of the Bible, but in all stories. And so uh, in plot development in the Bible, for example, uh, you can have uh, the problem. The problem was in Genesis 11 and verse 30 that Sarah was barren. But then there's um, a complication of that where God gives a uh, promise of seed to, uh, uh, to Sarah that she's going to have a, des a descendant and actually descendants like the uh, sand which is on the sea, like the stars of the sky. And, well, how can a barren woman bear children? And so that's the complication, and eventually that reaches a complex, uh, con, uh, uh, a climax uh, with the uh, telling of the story, and she tries to do it by human means, and God rejects that. But then ultimately it reaches this climax when Isaac is born, and uh, uh, in Genesis uh, chapter uh, 21. So problem, climax, resolution. But then you have a similar story in Genesis 22, uh, where Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac, his son. And of course, that's a complication because that's a threat to the promise. How could uh, he uh, sacrifice his son, which is the one through whom uh, the blessings and the promises that were given to Abraham had, were supposed to be fulfilled? Uh, and it reaches a climax in this story as he's draws his knife in Genesis 22 and verse 10, about to slit the throat of Isaac. But then it reaches a resolution. God intervenes. Uh, the angel of the Lord tells him, don't reach out your hand against the lad. There's a ram caught in a thicket that uh, serves as a substitute for Isaac. And at the end of the story, God confirms the promise again in Genesis 22 verses 12 and 13. And then uh, if you go to the story of the Exodus, well, Pharaoh uh, chases Israel after they left Egypt and uh, traps them by the sea, Genesis, Exodus 14. Uh, but then uh, uh, that reaches a, a, a climax because uh, Pharaoh regrets uh, having released them, but then God uh, intervenes and stops him and parts the Red Sea so that the uh, Israelites can escape. And then uh, the final resolution, as Israel gets on the other side, he lets the water uh, return to its regular level, and uh, Pharaoh's army drowns. Um, again, it, it does that pattern of storytelling that uh, we were mentioning before. Um, and studying how you know the plot develops is a part of literary, uh, the literary approach. Another aspect of uh, the literary approach is to examine dialogue and also uh, what's uh, sometimes called free direct discourse. Uh, we should mention that dialogue is rather sparse in biblical uh, narratives and Hebrew narratives. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't give a lot of talking, as it were. And so when it does quote the exact speech of characters in the story, we, uh, we need to ask the question, why is the narrator choosing to tell us this in the kind of detail that he does? And so uh, uh, since uh, dialogue is sparse, when there is dialogue, there must be a reason that he thinks it's important to convey it in detail rather than just summarizing what uh, they said or did. Now, another type of dialogue is what is called free direct discourse. And that's when you give the gist of what a character has said, 
more or less what a character has said rather than the exact words. Now, one of the reasons that this can happen is because uh, Hebrew lacks quotation marks. And so there's not a real uh, sharp distinction between direct quotation and paraphrase and uh, this category, which is actually somewhere between direct discourse and paraphrase. Uh, what you do, you're giving the gist of what he said. You give it as if it's what he says, but when you think about it, well, surely there was more to it than what, what was said there. Uh, so, for example, in Jonah uh, chapter 3 and verse uh, 3, you give the message of Jonah to Nineveh. Forty days and Nineveh will be overturned. Well, this is clearly a summary of what uh, Jonah said, but he obviously said a whole lot more than that. He may have said it in different ways than direct quotation of, of that, uh, but that's the narrator's summary of what Jonah said at that particular time. 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. You get the same sort of thing in the New Testament. If you look at the uh, dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3, uh, you know, you can read, read that whole dialogue in just a few minutes, but uh, clearly it's a summary of what uh, took place over a long period of time, probably an hour or more. And uh, you have to give the narrator a little bit of... Uh, uh, poetic license to summarize things rather than to be so caught up with exact quotation that you uh, make it difficult to tell the story in a coherent, uh, flowing uh, kind of way. So uh, if you give the gist of what the character said as if it's direct quote, even though technically it may not be direct quote, that's called free direct discourse. There's also the artful use of language. Uh, you get puns in the Hebrew text of the Bible. It doesn't show up in English so much. Uh, but if you were to read in the Hebrew, uh, Genesis uh, 2 and verse 7, uh, God created uh, uh, the man from the dust of the earth. Well, the word for man is uh, Adam, and earth is Adama, And... Uh, there's there's a word play in there. Those are related words. Uh, you could get that in English if you translated it. God created the earthling from the dust of the earth. That would uh, give you the pun that's in the original that usually doesn't show up in English translation. If you go from narrative to poetry, uh, or if you have poetry quoted within a narrative, uh, you'll find uh, a style of thing called parallelism. A parallelism is when you say something once and then you say something again um, in a way that corresponds with the first part. It could be synonymous parallelism where you say it once and then you say it again using different words. Uh, Israel uh, went to Egypt. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Uh, that would be uh, saying the same thing twice. That's synonymous parallelism. Um, but then you have antithetical parallelism, where you say something once, and then you contrast it with the next line of poetry. Um, so uh, you can say that the wise man does this, but the fool does the opposite. You get a lot of this in Proverbs, and that would be antithetical parallelism. And then there's chiastic parallelism, where you say it once, and then you say it again, but use the opposite word order uh, sorts of things. Uh, as we uh, study uh, Hebrew poetry in a later lecture, we'll talk about this in uh, some detail. There's the use of poetry as opposed to prose. In uh, Genesis 127, uh, and God made man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female he created them. That looks like it's poetry rather than a prosaic statement, uh, using a bit of uh, uh, matching lines, which we call parallelism. And well, again, you have to ask, well, why did you break into poetry at this point? And perhaps it's a way of glorifying the fact that God made human beings in his own image 
And that's so important that we're going to tell it to you in poetry rather than just stating it as a fact. There's also the use of imagery. Uh, sometimes in the Bible, you'll describe God as like uh, someone on the march. That happens in Habakkuk chapter 3. Well, that's the imagery of uh, like a warrior on the march. Uh, you have the image of God as a shepherd in Psalm 23. Uh, imagery is a part of literary analysis. Uh, you have irony. Uh, Jonah is told to go to Nineveh and preach to it. He jumps on a boat and goes the opposite direction. Uh, that's ironic for a prophet of God to do such a thing. Uh, well, irony is another part of uh, literary analysis where you see it happening. Uh, you have different genres that uh, can be analyzed. So in the Bible, you have riddles and parallels. You have apocalyptic. You have proverbial sayings. You have hymns and laments. You have war, woe oracles, uh, etc., etc. Uh, and analyzing the different genres in the Bible, uh, as form criticism also does, well, that's a part of uh, the literary approach. Uh, repetition and synoptic resumptive storytelling is also a part of it. Uh, biblical -like writers uh, like to use repetition a whole lot more than uh, we uh, moderns do. Uh, for example, you have the Joseph story. In the Joseph story, it says that, well, Joseph dreamed a dream, and this is the dream which, which Joseph dreamed. And in the dream that Joseph dreamed, he saw... And it goes on to tell the story. Well, uh, they, they just like repetition and uh, uh, analyzing how that works and observing that is uh, a part of uh, literary analysis. Um, we also mentioned before the art of synoptic, resumptive, expansive storytelling. Um, synoptic, resumptive, expansive storytelling is when you tell a story once and then you tell it again using different um, a, a kind of a different point of view um, in order to make uh, an artistic effect. And they do this uh, quite a bit, uh, whereas uh, we don't do it quite so much uh, in our storytelling, although we do get it sometimes in, in something like uh, flashback. When you tell a story and then you flash back to an earlier period and then you tell, tell part of that story again. Uh, the formal definition of synoptic, resumptive, expansive storytelling is the author tells the story once, often in a summary way, and then goes back and tells the story again, expanding on details or telling it from a different point of view. Examples, Genesis 1-1 arguably is uh, a synopsis of the creation account. Uh, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, one can argue that this isn't the first thing that God did. This is everything that God did. And then starting with uh, verse 2, and the earth was void and without form, uh, goes back and retells the story and says that, well, the way that he did that was uh, the seven days of creation. If you read it that way, well, this is synoptic. Uh, resumptive, expansive storytelling. Uh, you may also have uh, that in Genesis 2, uh, verse 26 through 27, uh, actually chapter 1, 26 and 27, and Genesis 2. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it tells the synopsis of the creation of uh, man as male and female. But then in Genesis 2, you flash back and resume the story and expand on it, giving details of how God created uh, the man from uh, uh, the dust of the earth and the woman from man's side, saying in some more detail how man came to be male and female. That's synoptic, resumptive, expansive storytelling. You also, uh, we argue that uh, you have that in Genesis uh, 15, uh, where you can explain some of the uh, seemingly uh, incongruities in the text. If you see the first part as telling a story of how God gave to Abraham, he renewed his promises, Abraham shows doubt, and then God reassures him, 
You get that once, and then you get it again uh, later in the passage. Uh, and the argument uh, can be made that, well, this is not uh, two events, but this is this one event told twice from different point of views, uh, one from the standpoint of uh, the seed promise and the other uh, from the uh, promise of the uh, from the land promise uh, point of view. And uh, that resolves some of the uh, apparent conflicts in the text if you read it that way, in which case it would be another example of synoptic resumptive uh, storytelling. And uh, I would argue that you get that in uh, Exodus, where uh, in uh, Genesis 19, you get a, uh, in Exodus uh, 19 through 24, in chapter 19, you get a summary of what God did on Mount Sinai. But then in chapters 20 through 23, you resume and expand that. In the book of Joshua, it looks like the ark is crossing the Jordan multiple times in Joshua chapters 3 through 5, but it could be synoptic, resumptive, expansive storytelling, where uh, the same story is told multiple times from different points of view. And you seem to get it also in the golden calf story in Exodus 32. You get it in Jonah in chapter 4, where you seem to have a flashback to retell the story with additional details. Uh, that's uh, resumptive repetition or synoptic, resumptive, expansive storytelling. And then there is a thing called gap filling. And that's the deliberate ambiguity or gaps that a, a storyteller leaves. Sometimes it's deliberate, maybe it's unintentional. Uh, but in any case, uh, the author of the story expects you to ask questions to try to fill in the gaps, to make sense of the story. And it's in the filling in of such gaps that we can come, a lot of times, to a deeper understanding of a text's meaning. So, for example, why did Uriah not go home to sleep with his wife in 2 Samuel 11? And we've already suggested, well, maybe when he went out and happened to meet with some of the servants of David, they may have told him a story about what they heard had happened between David and his wife Bathsheba. Um, that's gap filling. Now, again, it's a speculative thing to fill the gaps, but it does explain why he dared to say something that might have been insulting to the king uh, later on. And then... Uh, uh, you could ask the question, well, why is it okay in the law of Exodus uh, 22, uh, verses 2 and 3, to kill a housebreaker at night, but not to kill him if it's during the day? Because uh, it's considered uh, blood guilt if you kill him during the daylight, but if you kill him at night, then uh, there is no blood guilt. And you can speculate, well, perhaps the housebreaker at night, you don't know his intentions. Is he just coming, you know, to steal some stuff or is he coming to kill you? And so uh, defending yourself at night is uh, to the point of, uh, you know, killing the man that's uh, broken into your home uh, can be justified. But if it's during the day, then you can see his intent is not to kill anybody. He just wants to steal some stuff and to kill a person just for simple theft is inappropriate, and that would be uh, blood guilt. Uh, anyway, if you even ask the question, you're trying to fill the gap. And again, uh, why does Joseph, after he has gone to Egypt and becomes uh, uh, a leader in the distribution of the grain in Egypt, his brothers come and he recognizes them, but he's so changed and looks like an Egyptian official that they don't recognize him. Why does he accuse them of being spies, uh, even though he knows good and well that that's not who they are? And the answer there is that uh, he does that so he can have a pretense to throw them into jail. Perhaps initially he was thinking, well, I'm going to punish them for what they did to me when they uh, threw me into a pit and sold me into slavery. Uh, though before he gets around to uh, doing that, he changes his mind and uh, 
um, seems to be intent on finding out if they've changed over the years. And so uh, he keeps one of them and uh, sends the others home uh, to see if they uh, will betray that brother the way that they had betrayed uh, him or whether they'll come back and uh, 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 save the brother that's uh, uh, left in prison. Um, anyway, by asking the question, why does he do it? The text doesn't tell us explicitly, but asking the question is a form of gap filling. Well, those are the sorts of things that a person can do uh, in a literary analysis. And I'd encourage you to uh, uh, do these sorts of things as you read the biblical text.